Yeah. All right, so we are back at it, and we have Riston. And today we're going to do a part two to the Jesus did not die for your sins debate. And we want to keep it on topic as much as we can. And I'm going to give you 30 minutes. And you can go over what I brought out that you disagree with. Or you can bring out more information. However you choose. Um, it's your preference. And I am going to get ready to get started since everyone knows who you are. Since everyone knows who you are, rather. And you are on in three, two, one. Yes, hi. Uh, so it's uh, my personal belief that Jesus did die for our sins. I'm going to defend that position. Um, this is the nature of the debate here, so um, I'm just going to share a couple of new things first and then sort of go over some of the uh, points that we had uh, you know, specific arguments about. And uh, I'm going to try just when I introduce information to try to keep it um, references in the Old Testament to Jesus. So, uh, yes, I was just, just right off the bat. Uh, <clears throat> it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Um, and that is Genesis one, one. And I'm going to just read the Hebrew. I can pull it up. Let's see if I can get the full Hebrew text here. Uh, yeah, the uh, the Hebrew the Hebrew is basically it says Elohim, and so Elohim is a plural noun, but when it's used, it's it's used with a singular verb bara in the Hebrew. So even though Elohim is plural, it's modified by a singular noun, meaning that it's plural in form singular in meaning and that is uh, evidence of the trinity uh, right in the first sentence of the bible and anytime elohim is used uh it's it's strangely coupled like that so uh, it's it sort of it, it uh three in one is sort of what uh, you have there and then it also says uh let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish in the sea. So, let us, our image, our likeness. So, when God in Genesis 1, 20, verse 26, says that, he's using plural. Um, so, it's, it's obviously God is not just, God is one, but there's three persons. It's a mystery. Uh, and that is evidenced in the Bible. Um, and it says, let us make, uh, behold, the man has become like one of us. Again, and then in Genesis 3.22, and uh, in, in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, it says, who shall I send and who will go for us? So, you know, obviously God is being referred to as multiple. There again, and uh, lots of plenty of references of uh, all these all these uh, duplicates. So uh, let me close that. So I'm just going to read off a couple of uh, Old Testament verses. This is Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. It says, "I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their kindred, and I will put my words." to the mouth of the prophet, and the prophet shall tell them all that I command. So, obviously, Jesus was, in my uh, claim, not just God, not just the Son of God, but he was also a prophet. He did prophesy, he predicted things that would happen in the future. If you look at uh, Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 through 13, 
it says, I told them, if you think it best, give me my pay, but if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they valued me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them at the potter at the house of the Lord. So when Jesus was betrayed, he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord is speaking. The Lord says, throw the silver to the potter, the price at which they valued me. So God is saying they valued him at a price in Zechariah chapter 11, verses 12 to 13. Why would God, if he is, yes, God is invisible, but he's three persons. This, this is Jesus speaking. In the Old Testament, the Lord said, throw it to the potter the price they valued me. 30 pieces of silver, just like when Judas betrayed him. Uh, and also in Revelation 1.8, uh, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Lord God, who is, was, and is to come, the Almighty. So, if you take the Hebrew for um, yud heh vav -Heh, which is the name of God used over 6,800 times in the Old Testament, the word yud heh vav -Heh, those four letters are actually a composite of three Hebrew words. One of the Hebrew words is is. One of the Hebrew words is was. And one of the Hebrew words is is to come. So the name of God is also a compound word of was, is, and is to come. And Jesus is saying, the Lord God said, who is and was and is to come, the Almighty. So here Jesus is speaking in Revelation 1.8. He's saying he has always existed. He's claiming to be God, and that's consistent with the name of God in the actual words. So then you have Numbers chapter 3, verse 38. It's another reference to Jesus. Of course, that just closed on me. So it says, those who were to camp before the tabernacle on the east, before the tent of meeting towards sunrise, were Moses and Aaron and his sons guarding the sanctuary itself to protect the people of Israel, and any outsider who came near would be put to death. So uh, this actually is uh, when they were uh, assembling the tribes of Israel. So in the chapter, um, in general, this is sort of just one verse from it, but they assembled the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, if you read the actual um, arrangement, they had certain tribes go stand on the east, certain tribes stand on the west of the tabernacle, certain tribes stand to the north of the tabernacle, and certain tribes stand to the south of the tabernacle. And they give the number of people who are in each tribe in total quantity and total count of persons. And if you actually show that number of people on, like, a, a bird's eye view, it forms the shape of a cross. It's a reference to Jesus when God has them arranged around the tabernacle in such a fashion. It's actually a, a reference to the cross. And if you look at the setup of the tabernacle itself, it says that the altar, the basin, the menorah, the showbread, the incense, the Ark of the Covenant, if you map that out and you look at it from above, it forms a cross. All of those, it says, put this here, put that there. It's a reference to Jesus. If you look at the picture of any sword... A sword looks like a cross. So what was the thing that God put in the Garden of Eden to keep Adam and Eve out? It was a flaming sword. And essentially it's, uh, you know, I've never seen a sword that doesn't look like a cross, but it's basically, uh, you know, showing the picture of the cross. And when Jacob blessed his sons, he crosses his arms. Because that's symbolic of blessing coming through the cross. Uh, it's... Uh, the reason Jesus died on a tree is because at the very beginning, man stole from the tree and his feet were pierced because the very first messianic prophecy in Genesis is about his feet. Uh, his sight, it was about feet. Uh, you know, the serpent will strike your feet um, and you will crush his head. And then his side was pierced because Eve was taken from Adam's side. So he's making atonement for Eve as well. And, uh, they, the, Eve was the one who was led into temptation 
and his hands were pierced because we stole. And that's him actually taking the curse of us stealing and making atonement. And then he also wore a crown of thorns because it says when Adam and Eve sinned that the ground was cursed. And so he was taken and, and it was turned to, it was, it would grow thorns from there forward. And so God, Jesus, was taking the crown of thorns on his head to atone for the, to, to, to nullify the original curse of Adam and Eve. And then also, uh, the, uh, yeah, he put it back on his head and, uh, he literally takes all the curses. Uh, so, um, in the first day of the world, the first thousand years, during that time span, Adam fell into darkness and was separated from the light of God. During the second thousand years, times the time span, the earth again was covered by water during Noah's flood. During the third thousand year time span, Abraham was given the land of promise and was told that his seed would inherit the land. During the fourth thousand year time span, Jesus, the true light of the world, was born into the world as our um, as our Messiah, and then during the 5,000 years time span, the disciples were instructed to be fishers of men, and the Holy Spirit, in the form of um, a bird, a dove, filled the disciples, and thus they began uh, the exponential multiplication of birds and fish. During the 6,000th year, um, the uh, population of man exponentially increased, and now mankind is taking dominion over the earth. So you can see how in each of those examples, during the creation of the world, it corresponds to uh, the entire Bible, not just um, the Old Testament. Um, and each, you know, each of these things, Jesus, he, uh, you know, it's all corollary. Um, and then also, uh, day three of creation, the prophecy of Jesus Christ, how uh, he represents the hope of resurrection like seeds were created on the third day. Seeds are a fruit that hang on a tree. Seeds die and are buried in the dirt and are resurrected to life when they sprout through the ground. Jesus said, unless the seed dies and is buried in the ground, it remains only a single seed. Uh, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus was the eternal seed that hung on the tree, even though the thorns tried to choke out the seed the seed was being buried in the ground and raised to life on the third day, uh, reproducing the image after its own likeness. And Jesus is quoting Jonah there, which is also in the Old Testament. Um, and you have the temptations of Adam and Eve. Uh, Adam uh, was tempted with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Adam, you know, the, the, the devil says, did God really say you were not to eat from the tree in the garden? Or to Eve, he says it. And then the second Adam, Jesus, of Nazareth, the devil said to him, uh, the devil speaking to both of them about the lust of the flesh. Uh, you know, the woman saw that the tree was good to eat and uh, tell this stone to turn into bread. So he's appealing to his fleshly desires to eat. He says, turn the stone into bread. And then he says, the lust of the eyes... Just like in the Garden of Eden, uh, the woman was, was, was uh, the fruit was pleasing to the eye, and Jesus, um, the, you know, it was basically like um, all the all the connections between uh, how he was tempted are connected to that, and um, the seven days of creation, seven branches on the menorah, seven feasts of the Lord. There's all these number seven, and it just goes all throughout the Bible. And then also the mark of the beast in the book of Revelation is not the first time you see markings on the hand and the forehead. In Ezekiel 9, there's a vision from God saying, put the mark on the hand and the forehead of those who lament over the detestable things done in Jerusalem. If you didn't have the mark, you were slaughtered. So it was good to have the mark. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, God says, tie the commandments on your hand and bind them to your forehead. So that was good. Too. But in Revelation, the second beast causes people to take the mark of the beast on their hands and foreheads. But what no one talks about is that um, God then mentions the 144 who follow the Lamb. So the question is, who controls your thoughts, meaning on your, on your head, and your actions, meaning your hand? Your beast nature or the spirit of God?
So again, that's Ezekiel chapter nine and Deuteronomy chapter six. It, it mentions the marks uh, because the, the Bible is just a reflection, the Old and the New Testament. Uh, there's nothing in the Old Testament that isn't in the New Testament, including Jesus. He's alluded to, um, and then <coughs> Jesus in, in Jacob's ladder. Um, there's a couple chapters earlier uh, during the Tower of Babel where mankind tries to reach God uh, by building the Tower of Babel that didn't work. So flesh forward to Genesis 28, and God gives Jacob a vision, and this dream, Jacob saw heaven open a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it, signifying a connection between God and man in this instance. It was God who provided the means necessary to join himself to men, as opposed to the men of Babel who tried to reach heaven by their own strength, apart from God. So uh, if you go to the Gospel of John, when Jesus was speaking to Nathaniel, uh, he said, truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is the ladder. Jesus is the bridge between man and God. Like Jesus is claiming to be God again here. He's saying you're going to see angels ascending and descending on the Son of Man, meaning that I'm the bridge. So just like Jacob saw angels descending and ascending, Jesus is claiming again to be God, but he's referencing the Old Testament in chapter 28 of Genesis. Uh, he, Jesus just over and over again is claiming to be God. And then it says, uh, how does the menorah point to Jesus? Uh, Christ, uh, the menorah in the tabernacle, as God instructed, is one piece of gold beaten and formed into seven different branches. One piece of gold with seven different expressions of God in one spirit with seven different expressions. So the seven spirits of God in Revelation 3 talks about the seven spirits burning before the throne of in in the Revelation, and are the same seven spirits mentioned in Isaiah 11. Uh, the menorah was fueled by olive oil, um, and olives are crushed to produce oil. And in Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives, where Jesus, uh, on the Mount of Olives, where Jesus was crushed to the point of sweating blood, uh, the menorah has an appearance of, it's like a tree with leaves, if you see how it's described. Um, it's not just, uh, you know, in rods, it's actually buds on it, buds and blossoms, and uh, the menorah has long been held as a symbol of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, and um, mankind was no longer allowed to eat from the tree, but God was providing a way back to himself through Jesus Christ as the true tree of life to eat from. So the menorah is symbolic of Jesus because uh, he's claiming... Um, you know, to be rest restoring this when he's on uh, Gethsemane. And then uh, Jesus, uh, the writings of the Old Testament, uh, when he was baptized, got some notes here. And, I, yeah, and in Genesis 22, how you have uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Abraham's told to sacrifice his son. That's obviously a reference to Jesus as well. Um, you know, when God doesn't force Abraham to kill his son, but in the, Old, in the New Testament, Jesus does have to die. And then uh, there's also Nebuchadnezzar. What does it say? Nebuchadnezzar has to dip himself seven times in the river. Oh, no, no, that, that was uh, Naaman. I'm talking, Nebuchadnezzar was the king in uh, Babylon. He, uh, he was told everyone had to kneel before the golden idol, or they, you know, would be uh, thrown into the furnace. And he says he sees a fourth man I see walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar was looking at Jesus. Like, why would the Bible say the fourth looks like a son of the gods? Well, he was seeing Jesus in his glory. Obviously, the Messiah. He was seeing someone, uh, you know, supernatural. But why would the Bible even mention that? The Old Testament, because Jesus is in every part of the Old Testament. You can't possibly miss him. He's literally on every page. Um, the first Passover. Now let me read this. So he was the Passover Lamb. Um, number one, uh, there are. <coughs> 
Jesus was wrapped in swaddling clothes. Uh, if you remember in the New Testament, every Passover lamb was wrapped in swaddling clothes when born. Jesus was the ultimate Passover lamb. Passover lambs, as well as any lamb sacrificed at the temple, had certain criteria to be met. They had to be certified. The hills of Judea were filled with lambs, 700 sacrificial lambs needed yearly, and used, cared for by priests, priestly shepherds. And here are the criteria. They must be born in the hill of Judea around Bethlehem. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And uh, David was anointed by Samuel in those hills. Uh, so... And David, obviously, was, uh, you know, someone who would be in the line of Jesus. Uh, he was born in a manger that was uh, in the Migdal uh, Eater, the tower of the flock, not a stable. So, uh, in Micah 4, eight, just like Jesus was, Micah 4, eight says, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, Unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. So that's uh, actually kind of talking about Jesus. And it's a check by priestly shepherds for defects when born in the manger, as Jesus was in Luke chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, where it says, um, This will be a sign that by a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger, suddenly great company of the heavenly host appeared. Glory to God. And so they, he was actually inspected uh, by the wise men, the raccoon, the newborn, um, in swaddling clothes so they wouldn't break their legs when they flailed. And Jesus' bones were specifically mentioned as not being broken, which seems out of place. Why would it matter if his bones were broken or not? Well, because he had to fulfill the prophecy of being the Passover lamb. His bones could not be broken, so the crucifixions, typically they would break their bones. But Jesus could not have his bones broken because then he wouldn't fulfill the, the Passover lamb comparison. Uh, Jesus' birth was readying him for death. Uh, he sacrificed him. It's every detail. I could go on and on. Uh, the four, there's four days. Uh, a lamb had to be chosen and brought into the house four days before Passover. Four days before his death on the cross. On the eve of Passover, Jesus came into Jerusalem on a donkey. And that's <laughs> the, the original text is Exodus chapter 12, verses 3 through 6. And then it, it's mentioned when he rides in on a donkey in Matthew 12, Luke 19, and John 12. Uh, he was without blemish. He was sinless, uh, without cuts, bruises, deformities. Um, the lamb had to be in the prime of its life. Jesus was in the prime of his life. Um, the lamb had to be a male. Jesus came to earth as a man. Um, every house and family had to have their own lamb, so they had to personally accept him as their Lord and Savior. That's what that's referencing. Uh, the 14th day, the Passover lamb was slain on the eve of Passover, so he was killed on Passover. The leftovers, the lamb had to be consumed entirely on the eve of Passover, which he did, died completely on the eve of the Passover. He was killed, nothing remaining overnight, which they didn't. They took him down and buried him quickly. It was customary of the Passover lamb. It's obviously the one who died for our sins. Uh, firstborn, the lamb had to be a firstborn of the Israelites. It's, uh, and blood, they had to sprinkle the blood of the lamb on the doorposts in Exodus. So there's connections there. You've got, I just got to go on. So. Um, and then, let's see what else I've got here. I'm going to maybe mention, I don't know how much time I have, but a couple of things that we were talking about last time. You got six minutes. Yeah, okay, so. Six and a half. Okay, so, I could go, I could go on and on. Literally, there is not one page in the Old Testament that does not have a reference to Jesus. The Entire Bible is literally about Jesus. There's no ambiguity or doubt or question about it. You can turn to any page and I can show you there is a connection to the New Testament that's solid, strong, trustworthy on any page. But let me go to, and I'm willing to uh, take that wager more or less, give or take a page. Um, 
so where is this? So we were talking about the uh, yeah the the question of chronicles. So the answer of why the ages were different is the answer is the age versus time and captivity, which is not a reference to age. So the the reference uh, because there was different scribes writing it. Uh, you, should, I mean, you can you can see that it was uh, a reference to not the the age of uh, what is First Corinthians or uh, I have to pull up the verse, but that's that's just how I kind of reconciled it. Um, yeah, I, I can. That was just that was just references in the Old Testament. I didn't even get to talk about um, Islam at all or a lot of other things, but. find what bits I can before my time is up. Um, yeah, the sons Ezekiel is a little unorganized here. I have, a, I have a number of verses. Even Isaiah, I, I mentioned the Psalm 22, Isaiah 53, these are let me just read Psalm 22. This is all about Jesus. It says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? So far from my cries of anguish. That's, Jesus literally said that on the cross. Um, I cry out day and night, but I do not find rest. You are enthroned, you are enthroned as the Holy One. Our ancestors put their trust in you. Um, and he says, I am a worm, not a man, scorned by everyone. That's everyone seems to scorn the Lord. And he says, Rodin on the donkey, all those who see me mock me, they hurl insults, shake their heads. He trusts the Lord, let, him rest, let the Lord rescue him. That's exactly what they said on the cross. They said, let the Lord rescue him. So this Psalm 22 was written by King David. And this is literally in the, on the cross in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He says, that's exactly what the soldiers say. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. And then he broke me out of the womb. Do not be far from me. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Those are the Roman soldiers. Roaring like lions, tear their prey. They open their mouths. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. And my heart is turned to wax. It is melted within me. My mouth dried up like a pot's hurt. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me, packs of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. Psalm 22 says they pierce my hands and my feet. That's exactly what the Bible says in the New Testament. People stare and gloat. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. This is a step-by-step play of the crucifixion in the Old Testament. Like, give me a break. Like, you got to be kidding if you don't see that this is clearly God Almighty writing this outside of time itself. But you, Lord, do not be far from me. You are my strength. Quickly come to me. Deliver me from the sword, my precious life, so that I will declare to my people, for he has not been despised. Uh, it's just, you just, you just read it. Like, if you just read it, you'll see Jesus. He's, it's, it's the Old Testament is the New Testament. The New Testament is the Old Testament. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much my position, and I'm supporting it as best I can. And I, I could go on, like I said, in every, in almost every page, you can find Jesus. He, he's very clearly the author of the Bible. Uh, he's God in human form. Uh, it's a bit of a mystery how God can uh, inhabit a body. The Bible in the New Testament admits that, but there's clearly, uh, you know, a divinity to Jesus, just based solely on the words of the Bible, and whether or not you believe that is up to you, but the character of the words and their descriptions show divinity, sinlessness, um, prophetic um, comparisons, um, you know, all the things in the New Testament are found in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, like, there's, I, I could give a thousand examples 
literally there's not enough time. Like when Jesus is being uh, saving the woman from the well at the water, that's a reference to the book of Jeremiah. When Jesus, every, everything that Jesus does is, is, in, is in the Old Testament. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know if my six minutes are up or not. Oh, you got 26 seconds. <laughs> yeah, I'll let my time go. I'll let my time go. That's good. All I right. Appreciate that. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right, cool, man. All right. So now I'm going to get started with my 30 minutes, and I'm going to set my timer, and then uh, we can go back and forward like last time. Um, I'm about to start my timer. Right now, three, two, one. Now, today I went through our last discussion and I was listening to what you said and I was taking notes. And I was going to go through all of it, but with the information you gave me, I figured I still had time to go through it another time because you weren't not going to be able to be on, but we ended up being on. So I'll go with some of the notes that I took. Okay. Near death experiences have nothing to do with the word of God. God's word is God's word, regardless of what we experience. Resurrection is a New Testament word. The number 19 has nothing to do with the authenticity of God's word. For instance, if the Bible says God heals and then I pray and I don't receive healing, I can't take my experience and make that more realer than what God's word says. God's word is true whether we experience it or not. Now, Jesus being the Passover lamb is not spoken of specifically in the Old Testament. Paul, who was a Pharisee, gave us that doctrine. And that's in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. He says, purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump, as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Now, Paul, in fact, is the strongest prophet in the entire Bible, according to the Christians, because he is the one who tells us plainly that Christ died for our sins According to the scriptures, he doesn't give us any scripture reference. He just says it plainly. No one else, nowhere else that is said. Paul is the only one who says Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. There's no guesswork with Paul. He tells you plain. There's no way to look at that scripture and try to make it say something else. He tells you plainly. However, in the Old Testament, there's not one single phrase. The Messiah is going to die for your sins. Nowhere. Nowhere. Even Jesus said that he would give his life as a ransom for many. But he doesn't go into detail saying Christ died for your sins or he's going to die for your sins. None of that. Okay, now going on. Isaac and Isa. Amazing. When you look at the word Isaac, you have I S S A. When you look at Jesus, which in Arabic is Isa, it's I S A. So there are a few parallels in between Isaac and Prophet Isa. But this is the thing. Isaac was not killed. So therefore, Christians can't refer to this passage in Genesis 22 
as a foreshadow of Christ because they believe Christ was killed. Isaac was ransomed, according to the Quran. And we believe Jesus was ransomed. In other words, something was killed in their place. Just like Joseph was not killed, but something else was killed in his place. Being born of a virgin has nothing to do with the criteria, the criteria, rather, of a Passover. Neither being put on the cross or made a sacrifice. It's amazing how you see all these parallels you said when you can't see the parallel in between Joseph and Jesus. Joseph was not killed. It was a big lie. And it's the same thing with Christ, I believe. Being wrapped in swaddling clothes has nothing to do with being made a Passover lamb. After re-listening to everything you brought out, I really see no logic in it whatsoever. I conclude that it was all guesswork. If an ox gores a person, and a lot, and a lot, I gotta pronounce this word right, uh, an analogy. Jesus wasn't killed by an ox. Also, are you saying that Judas was his owner? <laughs> this is all speculation. Super superstition, assumption. You are taking it upon yourself to interpret the meaning of this with no clear revelation from God himself, simply because it says 30 pieces of silver. So every scripture where it says 30 pieces of silver, or we just going to try to tie that in connection with Jesus dying on a cross. Also, yeah, you brought up Zechariah, and he said, give it to the potter. So basically, Judas is the potter. He's the owner of Jesus. Of, of Jesus. You know, I'm looking at this stuff that you're bringing out, and I'm looking at the Bible, and what I see is that the Bible is too advanced for you. The Bible is a very advanced book. It has some of the darkest sentences and there's not one Christian that has ever been in this generation that can go through the Old Testament and tell you verse by verse what it means. It's a very, it's a very advanced book going on, okay? Um, this is all guesswork. It's conjecture. Just like the prophet Mohammed, peace be upon him, said. He said this. This is going to be Quran 4, 157. And for boasting, we killed the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they neither killed nor crucified him. It was only made to appear so. Even those who argue for this crucifixion are in doubt. They have no knowledge whatsoever. Only making assumptions. They certainly did not kill him. Now, this is a true prophet. Because, think about it. If you go to the story of Jesus, if you go to the Gospels, there's a whole lot of inconsistencies and contradictions with their stories. But if you go through the entire Old Testament, there's not one mention from God Almighty, and I'm talking about the Lord of Heaven. I'm talking about the one and only true God, God Almighty, who doesn't share His glory with nobody. I'm talking about the God of the Old Testament. I don't, I don't know about this God in the New Testament. I don't, I'm talking about the God in Isaiah who says that I am God and there is no God beside me. I'm talking about that God. All right? I'm going to read this scripture. 
It says, and for boasting, I just want to go over it again. We killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah. But they neither killed nor crucified him. It was only a made, it was only made to appear so. Even those who argue for this crucifixion, and I always say the crucifixion was a crucifixion. Get it? <laughs> they are in doubt. They have no knowledge whatsoever, only making assumptions. They certainly did not kill him. I heard you bring out the book of Psalms, references uh, like references of the strong bulls of Bashan. No Christian really knows what that means. This stuff is deep metaphors. All these scriptures are dark sentences. Remember, God only spoke plainly to Moses in the Bible. All the other prophets are dark sentences. It's to advance for you. But Christians take it upon themselves to be know-it-alls. And just like we say in Islam, Allah knows what you don't know. And I boldly declare that you, you don't know what the Psalms is really talking about. It's to advance for you. Going on. Christians, they take these scriptures and Psalms, Isaiah, all at face value and don't fully know the meaning of what they say. Also, yeah, I wanted to talk about this last time. You brought out Numbers 21, which connects with John 3, uh, 14 through 16, talking about Jesus being made sin and um, a picture of him being put on the cross was the brazen or the brass serpent that Moses held up for the children of Israel because God sent fiery serpent serpents um, to destroy them. So, you know, Moses was instructed to put a serpent made of brass. <laughs> and I would like, and some people would say, you know, that's going into a black Jesus. I mean, that's what some people will say. And I've heard people say that's going into Jesus being made the sin of the world. According to Paul. Okay. But other word, in other words, they put up this, this bronze serpent. And in those days, the children of Israel, okay, what happened in 2 Kings 18, 4, the same brass serpent that Moses put on a pole, the children of Israel started worshiping it. So what happened? Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 18, and let's read about this, this snare that uh, came upon the children of Israel. And it's the same snare that is upon the Christians, okay? So let me get that for you. This is going to be 2 Kings chapter 18. I'm going to start at verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he when he began to reign. And he reigned twenty-nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, did. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces. Oh, Jesus. He break in pieces the brass serpent that Moses had made for unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it and called it Nehoshaphat. So this same brass serpent that was supposed to be Jesus, the children of Israel began to worship it. They began to burn incense to it and it became a snare to them. And Hezekiah did that which was right and he broke the idol into pieces now that that's deep so i want to hear somebody explain this same uh, brass serpent as supposed to be jesus why didn't god destroy hezekiah for breaking that jesus if it was a symbol of christ it's nonsense going on revelations 1 8 i am alpha and omega the beginning and the ending saith the lord now it doesn't say 
that Jesus said he's God. If you look in the Bible, Abraham is called Lord. David was called Lord. Many people were called Lord, which means master, teacher. It doesn't say Lord God in my translation. It just says, I am the Alpha Omega, beginning and end, saith the Lord. Um, and then it goes into which is, and then it goes and says the Almighty. Now, this scripture is not saying that Jesus said that. And this scripture right here is in the book of Revelation. And when you look at this scripture, and you look at the life of Jesus, he never once called himself God. He never once ever called himself God. For instance, there's a story of a rich young ruler calling him good. And Jesus told him in the book of Mark, he told him that there's none good but uno, but one. That is God. Why? Because all throughout the whole Old Testament, it says the Lord is good. The Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. The Lord is good. His mercy endures forever. The first time it's mentioned is in Chronicles. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. The Lord is good. So when the man called him good and Jesus says, you know, why are you calling me good? There's none good but God. He was basically saying, I am not good. If you take away one of he literally said, I'm not God. Okay, Jesus never once ever told any Christian to worship him. He never told anybody to worship his mother. He never once. See, Christians assume, they assume, they assume, they assume. All they do is assume. There's not one scripture in the entire Bible where Jesus told anybody to worship him. But the Christians will say, well, he didn't stop them. When they worshipped him. According to the Bible, David was worshipped. They came to David and did obeyance to him. They came to Joseph and did obeyance to him. Joseph had a dream of his brothers doing obeyance to him. Okay? That doesn't mean he's God. It does not mean he's God. There's not one scripture where God, where, where Jesus says, you know what? I am God. You all need to worship me. You're assuming. You're doing exactly what the prophet said. He said all the Christians have is conjecture and assumption. All y'all do is assume. Y'all read scriptures and then y'all assume. You find a scripture and you assume. You find another scripture and you assume. That is the strength of the Christian. A Christian can't go to actual scripture where Jesus says, I am God, worship me. Or when God Almighty says, I'm going to send Jesus to die for your sins. There's no such things as that. All the Christian can do is go to a scripture like, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then assume, oh, that means he's God. Or go to a scripture where he says, uh, before Abraham was, I am. And then assume. Okay? When Jesus, read, when Jesus was talking, he was speaking in the person of God. But he wasn't saying that he was God. Okay, he said he came that we may know the one and only true God and that we may know him as the Messiah, as his messenger. He never once told anybody to worship him. And I, and I have to constantly beat that in. And one of the reasons why I do the Jesus did not die for your sins uh, messages is because there are a lot of Christians who do not know that God Almighty never once said that. The person who brought that out is Paul, for the most part. He puts it plain. He tells you plainly, Christ died for your sins, which is a complete lie. Going on. All right, so swaddling clothes. You know, Swaddling clothes in the Old Testament, I, I'm trying to find that. I typed in swaddling clothes, and it only comes up in the New Testament. But you said that was a connection to Jesus in dying on the cross or Passover or whatever. We'll, we'll get to that in the questions. Also, broken bones disqualify as a Passover lamb. I, I want to find out where that scripture is. According to the Bible, a sacrifice couldn't be beat up, couldn't be 
couldn't be sick, couldn't be lame. So, so you're saying that this, this sacrifice that was beaten to pieces, all of his bones were out of a joint. So every bone in his hand, every bone in his leg, every bone in his entire body. Are you saying it, it was out of joint? That doesn't even make sense. That has to be a deeper metaphor that you don't get. Also, he was pierced in his hands and his feet and not one bone was broken. This is garbage. This is baloney. Christianity is for dummies. I found out that Christianity is for dummies. It's for people who have no logic. And for only two or three years being in Christianity, and, 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 and you're coming up with this, and, and you're seeing this, I can literally just tell you from listening to you that when you, when you bring out scriptures, it's like you're going off of what somebody else said. From listening to what I listened to from you, you were bringing out Genesis 3.15 and, and all these different metaphors. These are all man-made metaphors. I've heard them before. I've heard the ox. I've heard all these different uh, Christians bring out these same metaphors in the past. And it looks like in your three years of studying, you're just going along with the flow. All right, going on. So, also, I want to talk about um, Jesus' death, okay, and him riding on a donkey. According to the Bible, <laughs> Jesus rode on a donkey and a colt at the same time. I want to know how that works, okay? Also, according to the Bible, Matthew, Mark, and Luke says that Jesus was crucified on the day of Passover. But in the Gospel of John, Jesus was crucified a day before Passover. That's John 19. Wow. Then, in Matthew and Mark, it states that the temple veil was ripped right after Jesus died. But Luke states that it happened before the Lord's death. Okay, I mean... Then you go to, uh, did he drink wine after, while he was on the cross, okay? Um, the answer is both yes <laughs> in John 19, 29, and 30, and then is also no in Mark 15, 23. They tried to give him wine mixed with myrrh, and he did not take it. So, you know, it's just like, man, there's so many consistencies. The story of Jairus. Was his, daughter already, was his daughter already dead when he came to the master? Or did his daughter die while he was talking to the masters? Okay, the Gospels record both stories. They both can't be true. Same thing. Did his disciples go into Jerusalem after his departure? Or did they tarry? Or did they go to Galilee? Same thing with the cross. Now, all of the Gospels say Simon the Cyrene carried his cross. But John, he says Jesus carried the cross by himself. Okay, this is what you call inconsistency. The sign. Now, think about it. I know for a fact that the four Gospel writers are all, um, they're anonymous. They're, they are anonymous, okay? And we know for a fact that if they are all supposed to be eyewitnesses, how come each gospel writer has a different uh, version of what sign was held above Jesus when he was crucified? They all have different titles. They all, if, if we are all gospel um, writers and we are all looking at Jesus being crucified, how come we are all putting different names Names for the signs that was above his head when he was being crucified. Okay, and it, it, the list goes on. Okay, the veil being rent from top to bottom. Okay, Matthew and Mark states the temple ripped right, <laughs> right after Jesus died. But Luke states that it happened before the Lord's death. And this is in the Bible. So... The prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. This man is a true prophet. He told us 
It was only made to appear to them that way. Okay, and then he gives us the most powerful scripture that even some Muslims and even Christians don't even know. Okay, and it reads, and this is Quran 4, 159, and it says, There is none from the people of the scripture but that he will surely believe in Jesus before his death. And on the day of resurrection, he will be against them as a witness. Okay, for dummies, what he is saying is, there is no way that you can believe in Jesus in the Bible. The, Jew, the Christians will not believe in Jesus until after his death. <laughs> they have not believed in Jesus yet. It says there is none from the people of the scripture. That's not the Israelis. They don't believe in Jesus. Okay. This is talking about the Christians. They will not believe in Jesus before his death. Indicating they have not yet believed in him yet. And on the day of resurrection. Jesus will be against them as a witness. Now, what is that going into? Jesus will have to deliver himself. When God Almighty says to Jesus, did you tell the people to worship you in your mom? Jesus is going to save himself. He's going to say, glory be to you. How could I say that which I had no right? You know what's hidden in me, but I don't know what's hidden within you. You know everything when I was there, but when you took me, you were a witness. He said, if you punish them, you punish them. But if you have mercy on them, you have mercy on them. So on the last day, on the real resurrection, <laughs> okay, Jesus is going to save himself. He's going to save himself from the judgment. And then he's going to tell those no miracle, non-healing, those, those fake counterfeit Christians with no power. All they can do is prophesy. Prophesy. They can't heal nobody. They can't go in a hospital and empty it out. They can't do no miracles, no healing. Their rabbi and the, the early church did all the miracles, but the church of today don't have nothing. They can't pray a fly off the windowsill. They have no miracles and no power. All they can do is prophesy and prophesy. Them same people, Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Because think about it. The Muslims ain't calling him Lord. The Buddhists ain't calling him Lord. The Hindus are not calling him Lord. The only people that is calling Jesus Lord is the Christians. And according to the Bible, Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. I never had anything to do with you in that New Testament. That's all Paul. Okay, that is all Paul. We got the letters of Paul before we got the letters of the Gospels. Okay, and we truly believe that the letters of the Gospels were shaped and formed by Paul. How come the man who wasn't even there during the first communion, supposedly, has the most knowledge of communion? Okay, I think there's some type of conspiracy going on. Okay, the church of today is powerless. My wife asked me the question. She told me when I was a Christian, I never really fully believed it because they said Jesus died for our sins. But sin is everywhere. Sin hasn't stopped. Sin is only growing. Sin has not stopped. Sin has not been conquered. Sin is still out there. And it doesn't make any sense. According to the Bible, the Old Testament all the way up to Malachi, God says that a man that sins is going to die. He tells you repeatedly that the son shall not die for nobody's sins. But all of a sudden in the New Testament, in the book that is most famous for being burned in Jerusalem, the New Testament, in that book is now saying that one man died for everybody's sins. That is complete garbage to a person who reads the Bible. If you've been reading the Bible, you will see over and over and over, God is telling you that 
a son shall not die for the father's sins. And my last scripture, I have 59 seconds left, is going to be in the book of Micah. A scripture you won't hear in the Christian church. This is Micah chapter 6, verse 7. Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? And then he asks this question. Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He's literally asking, should I give my firstborn? And Paul says, Jesus is the firstborn. Should I give my firstborn for my sin? And what does God say? He has showed you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Jesus told them, go learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And I'm done. And I'm done. So now it's time for our questions and answers. If you want to ask, you can ask. Uh, you got some stuff you want to bring out, we can go over. But I definitely have some stuff to ask you with, with all those uh, metaphors and his Passover lamb stuff and uh, the swaddling clothes and the broken bones and things like that. Yeah. I, I mean, in, like, you, you say that the son will not pay for the sins of the father. Yes. Uh, but the father did not sin. and the who, who, Who's the father? I'm not talking about God. I'm talking about the fathers. The Bible says that Joseph was Jesus' father, okay? Now, in, in Christianity, some of y'all believe that Jesus was born miraculously, and we believe that Jesus was, was born miraculously. But the Bible still calls Joseph Jesus' father, especially when he was gone and they was looking for him. Mary, the blessed woman Mary, peace be upon her, she told Jesus, me and your father was looking for you, okay? So Joseph is Jesus' father according to the Bible. I mean, if you believe the Bible or tear that out, okay? And Jesus died for his forefather's sins, okay? If you go to the genealogy of Jesus Christ, if you go to Matthew chapter 1, Abraham is the father of Jesus. David is the father of Jesus. Jesus was called the son of David. Okay, so according to the Bible, Jesus died for David's sins. And this is a huge contradiction. So now you can you can finish because you was trying to say the father didn't sin, but we're not talking about God Almighty. That's talking about the fathers. This is talking about humans. Yeah, I, I mean, personally, I would say that uh, it just comes down to the fact that uh, Jesus was not... Um, forced to pay for the penalty of the sin, but again, that he did it just voluntarily in order to take on that sin to pay for it. I'm still trying to understand you. Yeah. The Bible says that no son, Jesus is called the son of man 82 times in the Bible, okay? Y'all call him the son of God, whatever, okay? He is a son. Okay, he's called the son of the blessed. He's called the son of man, son of God. The Bible says that a son cannot pay for their father's sins. And y'all saying Jesus died for Joseph's sins, right? He died for David's sins because he died for the sin of the world, right? So how is that? That's a contradiction, right? Well, I would say that if, if God had forced him to die for the sins of David, then it would be. But because Jesus paid for it voluntarily, that it wasn't, it wasn't God who mandated it or forced it, but Jesus chose to pay for the sins of the Father. So it, the Bible doesn't, doesn't say that you can't pay for the sins of, of your father. Obviously, there's only one person who could possibly Yes, it pay does. For it says you can't. It says the Father shall. That word shall is the strongest assertion. Shall not. When it says thou shall not have no other gods before me, that's telling you you cannot have any gods before you, the Father. And it's telling you in Deuteronomy 24, 16, you can go there. It says the fathers 
shall not die for the sons, the sons shall not die for the fathers. And it says it like in multiple different books. Deuteronomy, the book of Kings, the book of Chronicles, the book of Ezekiel, the book of Jeremiah. It's not just one little island scripture, you know, like that Alpha and Omega, that one little, you know, little scripture in the Bible. I'm not building a mountain off of one scripture. I'm giving you multiple references and I'm not telling you what I what it thinks, what I think it means. We're going to what it says. And it says in Deuteronomy 24, 16, I'm going to go there real quick. This is a scripture Christians don't, they don't, they, they don't even bring this up. A lot of them don't even know it exists. It says the fathers shall not be put to death for the children. Neither shall the children be put to death for the fathers. Every man shall be put to death for his own sins. This is the exact opposite of what Paul teaches in Christianity. Would you agree? I mean, you can read it like that. But well, I'm, I'm not telling you what it means. You're well. Yeah. If I'm, you say "shall," it depends how you define "shall." If if "shall" is a command that you are not to die for someone's sins, then you're right. If the "shall" is meaning that you're not forced to, that, and that forced is something you just you made up, man. That that stuff you you you're doing. You're throwing stuff in there that's extra. There's no such thing as force, and there's no scripture that you can show me that can validate your claim. You do that a lot. You'll 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 say, well, this means this, but you won't have no scripture backing. I'm showing you that the Bible says the father shall not be put to death for the children. The children shall not be put to death for the fathers. Then it says this. It says every man. That means every man. Jesus was a man. He called himself a man. Peter called himself a man. He was called the son of man. It says that every man is going to die for their own sin. So in other words, can't nobody die for your sins? Just like if you was to go and steal something and go to court, I can't say, well, you know what? I know Riston. I'm going to go to jail for him. No, that's bull crap. That, that doesn't happen. And that doesn't happen in God's law of justice. This is all something that came up with the Pharisees. The Pharisees came up with this because the children of Israel brought this up in Ezekiel 18, 19. That's where it first started. When they asked, could their own children pay for the sins of the father? And God rejected it. He said, no. He said, if a person does that which is right, they're going to live. But if a person does that which is wicked, they're going to die. That's God's way. It's, you know, it depends. It, again, it depends how you define shall. Let's look at shall. Let's look at the word shall. Let's see if it has forced in there because I think that was your invention. I think that was your invention. And I'm going to go to the word shall in my Bible dictionary. And we look at it and see if we see any forced in it. There's no such thing as forced in it. Shall and should. I mean, you could say that it's a command. You could say that it's, you know. It's a maybe. command. Shall, when it says, if I was to say, thou shall not have no other gods before me. It is the same Greek word. It's the same Hebrew word, rather. If you was to go to Exodus 20, where all the commands are. This is Exodus chapter 20, where it says, thou Shout. Let's look at that word. And that word shout actually is the same word. Let's go to it. Oh, shall. All right. So let's look at it. Thou shall. Mm. Yeah, because I just... You know, I would just argue that, uh, you know, God is not, thou shalt not die for the sins of the father or the father, the sins of the son. It's meaning that God is not going to put a burden on the son or the father by his decree, by his command. No. So the burden no. is not from God. It was from Jesus to volunteer. And 
there is some precedent in the legal system. If you pay for someone's like speeding ticket, you can pay for their fine and they're free to go. So no, no, I'm saying if you was to go, if you was to go and commit murder right now, could somebody go to jail for you? No, don't think so. No. Okay, we're talking about the death of Jesus Christ. Okay, can't nobody go to jail for you? Okay, and you know it. Okay, we, we all can help one another on fines, and we can do that in the law. Even in the law, when you had to make a sacrifice, somebody can give you a sacrifice. Somebody can help you out. But if you were to be stoned, could somebody else step in? No. You had to go and be stoned. That's always been God's way. And when you said, um, talking about forced and shall, none of that is in there. That's all what I call assumption and assuming. If it's saying, you shall not have any gods before him, what is that saying? That, that means that's, that's a command, don't do it. Okay, so if he's telling you, you shall not have no gods before you, then you can't do it. So if he's telling you the father shall not be put to death for the sons, God is is the father. I mean, I know in Christianity we're 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 focused on you know you're focused on Jesus so, so much, but you gotta you, we can't forget what God Almighty has said, and He said this long time ago that the fathers cannot be put to death for the sons. And if you go to another translation, it will tell you it will actually break that down. Matter of fact, I'm going to go to the Bible Hub, and we're going to look at that scripture in another translation. Deuteronomy 24, 16, and let me go to the Bible Hub. Um, New Living Translation. Parents must not be put to death for the sins of their children nor children for the sins of their parents. Those deserving to die must be put to death for their own crimes. You do the crime, you do the time. Okay, that, that's where that all stems from. It says shall not, must not, and then I want to go to one, will not, um, must not, shall not, and then God's word translation says parents must never be put to death for the crimes of their children. That's God's way. That's God's way. And if you're saying that now Jesus could die for everybody's sins, then what you're saying is, let's tear the Old Testament out, and God has changed. God went from wanting obedience now he wants sacrifice. At first, he didn't really care about sacrifices. He, he didn't delight in sacrifices. He wanted obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice in the old-fashioned Christian church. Uh, they'll tell you that in the old-fashioned Christian church. Obedience is better than sacrifice. But uh-oh, in the New Testament, sacrifice is greater than obedience. Who cares what you've done? Jesus' blood has covered your sin, my brother. That's the New Testament. This is complete nonsense. Only a fool can't catch it. Well, if you... So, so if you believe that there's no atonement for sin, then how do you uh, theologically justify, uh, you know, the concept of heaven? Or philosophically even, like, do you believe in heaven? What's your, you know, you, if you want to get, you know, off topic a little bit. No, but we got to stay where you was just at. Now, we can deal with what you just said. You said, um, how can, if you if I don't believe in atonement um, through the death of Jesus Christ, well, how was David forgiven when he committed uh, adultery with Bathsheba? The, the mercy of God. God forgave him, right? God forgave him. He didn't get put to death. God just yeah. forgave him. What about Isaiah? Are you familiar with Isaiah, what he did? Uh, he was a man of unclean lips. He was a man of unclean lips. And what? And then what happened? He said, my eyes have seen the king. Talking about God, not Jesus. 
talking about God Almighty, and then he says, you know, um, you know, behold, and he, the, the angel took the tongues and took a coal, took a rock <laughs> from off the altar, and he kissed it. And his sins was taken away. His sins was taken away from kissing the rock. God ha can have mercy on whomever he wants to have mercy. Okay? He doesn't have to forgive every way the same time. And sometimes it was a sacrifice through an animal. Okay? And then there were other times a person would kiss a rock. Um, there was times where he just forgave. You know, all through the Bible, he's been doing it that way, you know. And so my thing is, when you ask me that question, there's not one record in the entire Bible where God causes a human being to die for anybody's sins. That That's all new. That's all very new. Jephthah's daughter. Did God tell Jephthah to sacrifice his own daughter? Didn't he? Huh? Didn't he tell her to him to sacrifice? No, no, God did not tell him to do that. He did that just like Christians, just like people do today. They just they just do things on their own free will. They do things on their own accord. He literally made he opened up his mouth and said some stuff that he couldn't took away. He literally said, "You know what, God? If you give me the victory, then I will offer up my daughter." And he said he had set his own daughter on fire. Now, I teach that's a type and shadow of Paul because that's exactly what Paul did to the Christian church. That woman never knew a man. She never knew Jesus. OK, but here we have Paul. He literally set the church on fire because the church, I believe, of today is committing idolatry because they are worshiping Jesus as God when he is the creation. OK, there's so much I can get into. Um, but I want to really stay on that same topic. But the the story of Jephthah's daughter being sacrificed, God Almighty never once told him to do that. He did that on his own will. Other than that, Isaac, we can't compare that to Jesus because Isaac was rescued. God loved him. He didn't forget about him. He saved him. OK, he, he saved him and then he killed somebody else. Same thing with Joseph. Joseph was thrown in a pit. They lied. They said he was killed, but he wasn't. He was governor. Okay, he was in charge. And what was killed in his place? The Bible says a kid goat was killed in his place. Something was ransomed in his place. And we believe in Islam that something else was killed in Jesus' place. If you go to the Gospel of Barnabas, they'll tell you that Judas was killed in Jesus' place and Jesus was rescued. So it doesn't make any sense whatsoever to say that Isaac was a foreshadow of Christ. It, that don't make no sense because Isaac was not killed. If Isaac was killed, maybe, but Isaac was not killed. The actual moment right before he died, it was just at that exact moment. So it was like, it was pretty close. Ransom, a sum of money or other payment demanded for or paid for the release of a prisoner. Go to the other definition of ransom. Go to the last definition of ransom. It's going to tell you that a ransom is a deliver or rescue. The Quran says God ransomed Isaac. So he killed something else in Isaac's place. And it was a ram caught, caught by the horn of his thickets in our Bible. Something was ransomed. That means something else was killed in its place. Most people go to ransom and the first thing they want to go to is the sum of money. But that word ransom has many definitions. And the last definition actually means to deliver or rescue. That's how Isaac was. That's how if you say Isaac, some people believe it was Ishmael, but that's a whole nother topic. But they believe that Abraham's son, the Quran says Abraham's son was ransomed. 
So he wasn't killed. Something else was killed in his place. Same thing with what Jesus said. He said, I came to give my life a ransom. He didn't say, I came to die for your sins on the cross. No, he didn't say that. No, no, he didn't. Paul says it. Paul is the prophet. Paul is the best man on earth, wouldn't you agree? Ain't Paul the, the best man on planet earth? He, Paul said, I'm, I'm the worst sinner. I think he says that. He said that about himself, but but think about what he's done. He's wrote 13 letters, and he told you plainly that Christ died for your sins. Nobody else told you that. Nobody else told you that. Without without Paul, you wouldn't you couldn't be a Christian because he's telling you that Christ died for your sins over and over and over and over again. There would be no Christianity without Paul. Well, you know, the I mean, to be fair, the gospels mentioned. Well, well, how do you how do you become saved? What scripture do you go to to be saved? Let's just be honest, man. Let's just stop playing. Where what scripture you go to to get saved? First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verses one through No, nah, man. You've been you gotta tell me the, the scripture right now. If you was to go into a standard Christian church, what scripture are they going to give you? Romans 10, 9. Come on. If you confess, yep, with your mouth and believe in your heart, you shall be saved. He is the one. He is the one that you go to to get saved. Paul. Paul is, he is the heart of Christianity. There would be no Christianity without him. All right, so we, we got to keep it real. We can't sit up here and, and sugarcoat it. You don't have anything coming from God Almighty where he says, I'm going to send Jesus to die for your sins. All you can do is do what you've been doing, like going to the book of Exodus, going to the ox and, and saying, oh, oh, that means this. But God didn't say that. God never once said this ox uh, goring uh, uh, a man represents Jesus dying for you. That's that's something you're doing on your own will. That's dangerous. That is very dangerous what you're doing. You're assuming and you're taking it upon yourself to interpret what the Bible means when God doesn't give you any clear direction. He doesn't give you a scripture that backs that. All you're doing is going to scriptures and you're looking at it and saying, oh, I believe this means this. That's dangerous. Well, in the in the book of Acts, chapter two, verse thirty-eight, and, and Acts was written by Luke. Who was a no, child. no, the book of Acts is unknown. Nobody knows who wrote the book of Acts. Acts uh, was written by Luke. No, it picks up where Luke left off at, but Christians assume Acts is written by Luke. Acts, if you was to look it up right now, you go to your internet and ask, who wrote Luke? It's anonymous. Just like who wrote he Hebrews? Anonymous. And people will tell you. Some people will say Luke, but if you really, really look at it, some people say Paul. And then if you look at it, some people will literally tell you the authorship of the book of Acts, traditional theory is Luke, but it doesn't say Luke wrote it. A lot of, yeah, I mean, you know, if you want to look into the exact person who wrote down the words, this, it's, uh, I mean, what does it say in the first chapter of Luke? Um, undertaking, I don't know, it's, uh, not what I was looking for, but... Theopolis? You're talking about Theopolis? Um, what obelisk? No, Theopolis. Oh, Theopolis. No, no, I see that, but that's not what I was looking for. I, I just, uh... Because Theopolis is not Luke. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Yeah, the... I mean, you know, the book, it's called the Book of Luke. Uh, you know, presumably written by Luke. Um, presumptuously, presum 
presumed. And, and and the Quran really is not headed by names of writers either. And many of the writers of the Quran uh, conflict with each other as well and argue the three main composers of it. No, the, 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 the Quran is written by the companions of the Prophet only 20 years after his death because it's all oral tradition. It's called the recitation. It was a law written on their hearts, and they, they all knew it. They only wrote it down 20 years after he died. The only thing there's the, the, they have discussions on and, and they disagree with is on the Hadiths, which is not the Quran. God only promised to preserve and protect the Quran. Now, the Bible doesn't have a protection. The Bible just tells you if you change it, you're going to get a plague on your life. It gives you the opportunity. It says, hey, if you add to this book, God's going to add plague to your life. If you take away from the book, God's going to take away your name out of the book of life. But in the Quran, it says God will preserve it and guard it from corruption. That's the reason why it's only written in one language all the way through. Not the Bible. The Bible's written in a couple different languages. You know, un unknown authors. Different time uh, gaps and all type of stuff, man. You know, and, so and a lot of the uh, like you're saying, different different uh, parts, like when was the veil torn and different discrepancies, things like that. Um, I do believe that there is symbolism, even in like uh, the Book of Revelation says, uh, you know, that the dragon was thrown out of heaven. Um, do I believe it was a literal dragon that was thrown out of heaven? No, I think that is symbolic of Satan. So there's some symbolism in the Bible. I but that's a I different think. symbolism, man. I can agree with you on the dragon, but we're talking about a difference between one person carrying the cross, saying it was John, and then another person carrying the cross. No, that's a contradiction. Just like when I took you to Chronicles and Samuel. One says 40,000 footmen, one says 40,000 horsemen. One says 700 carriots, one says 7,000 carriots, okay? Just like uh, Jehoiakim, or one saying he's 18, one says 8. No, that's man's mess-ups. Those are not metaphors. Metaphors or deep meanings can go with dragons, can go with an ox. I'll give you that. I'll give you that on the ox, goring a man, okay? But we're talking about actual... Um, where it says that the temple was torn after his death, and then it says the temple was torn before his death, that's a contradiction. Okay? When it says they were to go, supposed to go into Galilee, and then it says they went in Jerusalem, that's a contradiction. J.R.'s daughter dying while the rabbi was there, and then before the rabbi, that's a contradiction. You know, those are inconsistencies. The signs that were on his cross those, if they are eyewitnesses, how come they all see in different things? Which one is telling the truth? You know, this is what we're dealing with when it comes to the Bible. The Bible has errors. You just got to deal with it. You can't apologize for every mistake. That's what the apologists do. They apologize for every, every error. And, and what they do is they drive people away from the Bible because they can't just be honest. And say, hey, we believe some of it is inspired by God, but we do believe that man has made mistakes. You know, and just be honest. Especially when you get to spelling errors and then numerical errors, you know, that don't make no sense. We just need to be honest and don't lie. So, I mean, in terms of these contradictions, uh, you know, maybe let's, let's say that, uh, you know, we just agree to disagree, but... If you look at the Bible, a lot of uh, the things that uh, archaeologically it claims uh, come find out always come out to be true. There's never been an archaeological claim in the Bible that's been disproven. Uh, um, archaeological? Uh, uh, yeah. cl what do you mean? So the, uh, the when Moses was visited by God on Mount Sinai, and the the, the, the presence of God lit up the mountain on fire. Uh, they have found a mountain in uh, that region that they believe is Sinai because at the top of it, it's completely covered in obsidian rock from extreme heat, like from a fire. That uh, and it's and it's right there. And at the bottom of the mountain, they have ancient cavemen drawings of a golden calf. And uh, 
Uh, it's, you know, clearly not ancient cavemen. It was the Israelites. Uh, there's also, um, you know, the Grand Canyon scientists will say, oh, it was a meteorite that hit the Earth. But if you look, it actually flows right from the Colorado River, including a few other rivers. It could have easily have been formed after Noah's flood when the waters receded and drove down into that region. Uh, there's also... Uh, the Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat, as mentioned in the Bible. None of these things have been screwed. They found the actual uh, Noah's Ark, and they've even recreated Noah's Ark based on the words of the Bible, because uh, just specifically based on what the Bible says in Kentucky at the Ark uh, Experiment. Uh, they've had just so many archaeological... The uh, At the bottom of the Red Sea, when the Egyptians chased uh, Moses through the water, the chariots were... Um, all drowned in the ocean, in the, in the sea there. The, they found chariots at the bottom of there. They also, where the pillar of fire was, they see that there's that there's um, actual place where the, there was a pillar of fire across the sand on the seashore, and they show you pictures of it. There's also um, sulfur bowls where Sodom and Gomorrah was. They found sulfur that's 99% pure in bowls in an area in Israel that just seemed out of place. Like, where did they come from? Uh, there's uh, so many archaeological discoveries that there's never been one that the Bible has been shown to be refuted as of yet. So, but I mean, yeah, evidence to the credibility of the Bible. Let's deal with the archaeological um, about the uh, the ark. Now, according to the Bible, they said that the ark was found in Mount Ararat, but the Quran says it was found. In Al Judy, in 1994, the ark was found right below Al Judy. Okay, so the Bible was 32 kilometers away from where the ark was actually found. They actually found the ark where the Quran says the ark was. Now that's right there. And I and I and this is no bull crap because, like I told you, I, I study. I'll send this to you right now. Send it. I'm gonna send it to you right now, and you can look it up for yourself, and you'll see, Riston, that the ark Noah's ark was discovered closest to where the Quran said it was, not where the Bible says it is. And there's a few other errors about the story of Hammond. Um, there's there's a few stories that are in the Bible that researchers have found that the Quran was more accurate and I have my book downstairs and one of them is the story of Hammond um, the one who was uh, wanting Mordecai to be killed and he wanted the extermination of the Jews so there's a few other um, errors even in that area okay so I sent you I just sent you that right now but I know you still have more and I still have a few questions, and I'm surprised you're still on. Yeah, no, I'm here. I, you know, <laughs> no, it's uh, even even Marco Polo was uh, when he circumnavigated the globe was uh, reported that he had seen uh, Noah's Ark um, where on, on Mount Ararat when he passed by there. Um, and Ron Wyatt also, you know, claims that he saw it in the '70s or the '60s. Yeah, but that was 32 kilometers away from where it actually rested. It rested right below Al Judy. That's 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 right now. That's why right now you want to know where the scientists are going. You think they're going into Christianity more or they're going into Islam more? They're going into Islam more. The scientists are going into Islam more than they are going into Christianity. Christianity is like the rabbit, man. It it, 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 it had its time. It went fast. And trust me, you got three years in, bro. I got 20. Okay, I got 20 years in. And Christianity used to be on top, and it's still the number one largest religion. But Christianity is losing its power. Okay, right now, look, we just had the president. We just had the president have a national gay holiday. On Easter, man. Come on. We can both agree. Come on, man. 
Come on, man. Christianity is a joke, man, today. It is a joke, man. Every, think about it. Nobody hates you for being a Christian in this area where we're at, right here where we're at, okay? And the people who do hate Christians, they hate Christianity for the right reasons because they look at Christianity as idolatry. And that's the reason why a lot of people come against Christianity because they look at it as just sun worship. But far as here, you're popular for being a Christian, okay? Think about Jesus. Is he hated or is he loved? Think about it. Jesus is love today. Even though Jesus said false prophets, people will speak well of them. That's how you know the, the story, the true message and the true character of Jesus has been altered and changed. Because right now, Jesus Christ is superstar. Everybody loves him. Okay? But everybody hates Muhammad. Everybody hates Muhammad. Okay? They hate that man. They, they literally hate that man. Christians will go to the max to bring up any little dirty thing they find on that guy. Jesus is loved. The prophet Muhammad is hated. But Jesus said the real prophets will be hated. How come Jesus is not hated today? He's not. You know, I I, I mean, there are people, you know, first of all, there's people, exceptions, type of rule. But Who hates Jesus? Who hates Jesus? Come on, man. There's churches on literally every corner. Almost. You know, uh, in in both China and in North Korea, they have a version of the Bible. With I told you over there. there. Okay. For the, you know, the grand ruler. <laughs> you know. What religion is hated the most? Islam or Christianity, man? Let's just be honest. America has 1.1% Muslim. 1.1% Muslim. Right here in America, Islam is hated. Islam is the most hated religion on the planet. Right now, we have a Christian nation helping people who don't even believe Jesus is the Messiah kill the Palestinians. Look at that hypocrisy. At least in Islam, we do believe Jesus is our Messiah. We just don't believe, believe the guy is God. That's it. But what is America doing? Joe Biden has been helping a nation of people who reject Jesus, who make songs that say Jesus is a bastard. Okay? They hate Jesus. They are helping the Israelis kill the Palestinians. And then drops a drops um food aid. Then gives them food. Like Come on, look Look at that hypocrisy. You help in killing these people, but then you want to airdrop some food just to make yourself look like a Christian. Christianity is a joke, man. It's just be honest. It's well, a joke. I'll say this, that we're, that we're, you, you, you asked what's more hated, Christianity or Islam, but I wouldn't frame it in that perspective. I would say that we're just trying to make a truth claim about what is true and what is not. So it's like saying you hate gravity. Like, well, you know, if, if, it's, if it's true, then it's just what it is, you know. So you don't want to admit? And I, I wouldn't say that we should hate anything until uh, it, that we're looking through the perspective of is this true or is this not true? I uh, hate might be the wrong way to um, try to understand something, uh, you know, just in my opinion. And also, I personally, as a Christian, uh, we're supposed to show the love of Christ. So if I hate Muslims, then I am a uh, you know, hypocrite. I'm supposed to love everyone. So I can't, you can't, you can't ask me what, what, what religion is more hated because a true Christian is not supposed to hate. Uh, really, it's just a matter of God. He's going to clean up what the Bible calls sin. And it's, uh, yes, I suppose that Jesus I thought he already did that when Jesus today. died on the cross. I thought sin was already destroyed. According to the Genesis 3.15 revelation, that the sin was destroyed. How is sin destroyed, man? So, just even the, it says in the Bible, even the demons believe that Jesus was the Son of God. But you have to apply it. Demons have... No, 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 no. It says, even the devils believe that there is one God. Right. Okay, the devils believe that there is only one God and tremble. That's James. Okay, so 
It don't say Jesus. It says they believe that there is one God. Okay, okay, I'll give you that. And but the you know fact is, uh, just believing that Jesus is God isn't enough. You have to, um, by faith, receive Jesus and what He did on the cross and say, "I want to apply that." You know, oh, man, that is spiritually. You know, so it's just is a faith based action. Where does it say Jesus is God? Where did where how many references you have of Jesus saying I am God? Worship. That's a great question. Um where did Jesus tell somebody to worship him? God. And that's a And there are a number of places and I'll try to see if I can pull some up on the fly here so close uh, Jesus claims to be God. Did Jesus claim to be God? So let me see if I can. Uh, where does it say that Jesus is God? Where does it say Jesus is God? Worship me. I want, I want, I want. The Bible says we are not supposed to worship nobody but God. It's very clear. You shall have no other gods before me. So show me where it tells us to worship Jesus. Yes, I'm going to just pull it up. Just uh, My computer actually just uh, shut off. Oh, okay. I'm right here. I'm, I'm waiting patiently. If you want to wait, I have, the, I have this specific. Uh, maybe you can see it. I'm trying to share it on email. You know. There's a number of places where Jesus, uh, I think, claims to worship bull, worship worthy, and uh, claims to be God. There's a part, I was trying to look it up uh, later, open that, and restore. Okay, so this is. God. This is this is pretty critical. All right. So it's worth looking at this up. Uh, that's not the one. Let's go to experience. Uh, okay. So yeah, it's, honestly, I'm just like. Really, just trying to pull things together, but I think that definitely uh, I'll come back with Jesus as God claims <laughs> for you with get more in depth. Uh, we have another discussion. This is you're not going to find that in there because God is not a man. It tells you right there in Numbers, God is not a man. God is not the Son of Man. You know, God is not a man. Is in the Bible three times by three different people: Samuel, Hack. Hosea, and by Moses. Moses was the first person to tell us that God is not a man. So you're not going to find those scriptures where Jesus is saying he's God. All you're going to do is find a scripture, and then you're going to do what you're, what y'all do. Y'all look at a scripture and say, well, this means this. But that's not clear. Because I can look at a scripture, you can look at a scripture, and we both can guess what we think it means, but what it actually says is the most important what it actually says god is not a man then that means jesus should never ever be called a man and in john chapter 8 verse 40 it actually reads from jesus own mouth he told the jews this he said but now you seek to kill me a man that has told you the truth that's where we're going to pause. We're going to pause right there. Jesus said, you are seeking to kill me a man that has told you the truth. So in other words, if Jesus is God, he just lied. He just said, I'm a man. And I'm not putting any words in his mouth. I'm not doing that. This means this. He said, but now you seek to kill me a man that have told you the truth. That's the truth. That's the truth. This is kind of how I would explain uh, Jesus. Like, if you had 
you have a game and you're playing this game and there's a character in this game, let's say you uh, play a game like Counter Strike and you're playing this uh, character, you're playing a you know a police officer or you know an, an an enemy character, you are you are playing as that avatar, but you're not actually that avatar, but you are in the game. So like Jesus is the uh, you know the body, but inside Jesus is is the Father and. Oh, so, like, whoa! Jesus is in the game, and you know the you know like basically you're in two places at once. You're in the game and you're watching the computer. So like you can understand that analogy, and that's really what I would say Jesus is like to understand. You you have you have more experience with the person of Jesus and the Trinity than you might first assume. Just giving that analogy of an example to try to, you know, give you something to relate to. No, we're we're. He said that we were gods as well. Jesus said that the Father was greater than him. He said none is good but one. Now you got to be respectful to Jesus. Now we don't want to twist what he's saying. He didn't claim to be God. His disciples didn't think he was God. They thought he was the rabbi. They thought he was the master that teaches us the truth of God. He said, my God and your God. Okay, he said, I go to my father. He said, I go to my God and your God. According to the Bible, Jesus is our brother in the book of Hebrews, the unknown author. Jesus is our brother. So how could our brother be God? How could our brother be our father? That's, that's confusion, man. And let's say let's say you have that same character and you know just as a joke you put on god mode which means you have extra you know extra grammatical abilities outside of the game you know that would make you god in the game um you know so that's sort of what jesus was uh having the power of he had all the power of god if he like he says to lazarus uh, you know, Lazarus rise from the dead. If he, Jesus had just said rise from the dead, he has the power of God. All dead would have rose from the dead. He, Those are assumptions. That's not said. He said, my father always hears me. It was God who rose up the dead, not Jesus. It was God. Jesus wasn't the first person to raise somebody back to life. He wasn't the first. God did the work. He said, it's the Father that does the work. It wasn't him. And if you, uh, if you go to uh, John 17, I think verses 11 and 12. Uh, 11 through 12 in the New International Version. Um, that God is in me and, I'm in, and I am in him and we, that we all may be perfected in one. Yes, it says, I, yeah, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name. Why didn't your he name. say protect them by the power of my name if he's well, God? He says, the name you have given me. And then he says, so that they may be one as we are one. So that we're all, so we are all God. If well, Jesus is one with God, then we are all God. There will be. Well, there, there will be a separation from people who, for instance, if you get married, uh, yeah, I guess that's the hypostatic union, where you have two become one flesh. It's a spiritual thing. You're not literally one flesh with your spouse, but in spirit you are. So Jesus is saying, in spirit, I'm one with God. And that in the goal of Jesus is to bring us into union with him and to give us the same power and authority he had so long as we repent. So there's no power in Christianity. There's no well, there's no miracles in Christianity. Y'all faking miracles today. Y'all well, not well, doing no miracles. The hospital I, is getting more packed every day. Well, you know, in the book of Mark, uh, in chapter five, let me see this. Mark, Mark six six. That's a interesting number it says and he marveled because of their unbelief and he went around the, the, about the villages teaching um but 
lay hands on few sick folks. And he could not, and and, and he could not do no mighty work save that he laid hands on a few sick folks uh-huh. and healed them, and he marveled at their unbelief. So uh-huh. the, the, I mean, it does require an iota of faith. The Bible says a mustard seed of faith, but some people just, no matter how much you want for them to, you know, receive something, they just won't. Now, does that mean God can't heal them? Absolutely not, because if God is God, which, you know, this isn't something we disagree about, that God is all-powerful, so God does not have to limit himself, although he does limit himself by, you know, choosing to limit uh, his affecting free will, just observationally we can say that, but, uh, you know, I would say that it does have to do with uh, lack of faith, but if people would have faith, I've seen healings, and personally I've had uh, terrible anxiety, and I was healed. Of my anxiety, so that's. I mean, I don't need to prove that to anybody that I was healed. So it's, uh, you know, because I, I do believe in the casting out of demons. So I did. I did have demons cast out. I had anxiety, and then after that, I didn't have it anymore. Over the period of uh, thirty to forty-five days, every day my anxiety just went away, and uh, just prayed, you know, basically uh, to Jesus. So. I thank the Lord for that, and that's just a miracle, just to say, because how else, have you have you ever seen anyone be healed from anxiety? You know, I mean, I'm a walking testimony of that. Everyone else is just on meds, so. I mean, that's what you say, you know, that's your experience, you know. Most people, when we when we come to Jesus, look, when we, when we come to Jesus, we have the most fabricated stories. It's like, it's like we come to them and we say, oh, I've been healed of this. Or I've been healed of that. And, you know, that's just your testimony. Everybody has that same story. They all have these. It's just like when somebody dies. The day before my, my deliverance, I had terrible anxiety. The day after, it just went away. I mean, that doesn't mean time and chance happens to us all. That doesn't mean that God Almighty, um, that doesn't mean that what you're saying is true. That doesn't. God's word is God's word for the most part is true. It is called a double edged sword. Okay, that means I know when it to me when it says there's a double it's a double edged sword, that means it's truth and falsehood in the Bible. That's how I look at it. I look at truth and I see lies. I see both. It's a double edged sword. This is the reason why David did not conquer Goliath with a sword. He conquered him with a stone. He okay, he didn't prove, he didn't test that story. Now that's all you know, just what I believe in my metaphors. But bottom line, everyone comes to Christianity and they have this this facade. They have this story. They have this story of deliverance. But yet, there's not one Christian that can go inside a hospital and empty it. There's not one Christian walking in the miracles of Jesus. There's none. None. Yeah, and the stories they have is all made up. The only thing a Christian can do today is prophesy. They'll say, oh, I see you. You're going to be doing this. And, oh, you're going to be doing this. And half of them lying. They don't even have enough uh, forgiveness in their heart to say, you know what? I'm sorry for that lie. I said you was going to have a business next week. That was a lie. Okay? Yeah, Christians yeah. just lie. Proud. They lie. Proud, lonely, and confused, and honestly greedy. Yeah. Yeah. No, no miracles. Be honest, man. No miracles. No miracles. I, I, this is what I'll, I'll admit, that the American church to function in terms of Christianity does not require miracles to prosper or be successful financially. So the, the need to, like, you know, survive based on miracles like in the book of Acts, that all the claims of the miracles of the disciples and apostles, uh, you know, were doing... Uh, that, that's not really needed in, in in this country anymore. But that's um, so you're saying no healing is needed. No healing is needed in these countries no more. What you say? Oh, oh, no, no, no. For them to make money, <laughs> uh. because because yeah, there, there's a lot of greedy people. Look at uh, a lot of these pastors. You know, it says in the Bible that it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And a lot of these pastors, they. They're more concerned. They, they, there's no Holy Spirit in their church. They weren't told by God to start a church or to become a pastor. They're concerned with their money, uh, with religion, instead of this direct relationship with Jesus. They don't do any miracles, like you're saying, healings, raising of the dead, uh, true prophecies, um, you know, uh, casting out of demons, 
just all the all the different uh, types of, of power of God. Because uh, they, a lot of these pastors, they can read their Bible, they have mixing in New Age teachings, which is demonic. And, yeah, I, I don't I don't have much faith in the in the church really, except for you know a few people who are doing a good job. I yeah, I could share a couple of people who actually they just literally day after day they're just performing miracles. These people they're out there, real Christians. But like your average Christian, they don't even, the average Christian only leads two people to Christ in their life. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I, I, I can't even believe that. That's very, uh, it's a shame. It's shameful. So I don't know, but yeah, they, there are, there are people doing miracles. Uh, I don't want to tell you about too many of the miracles that I, yeah, yeah. I mean, your experience is, you know, I mean, I really don't go off experiences. I, I like, I like for a fact, I like for, like for instance, if you're not going into the hospital and emptying it out, bringing the whole hospital out of there, trust, trust me, if you was to go into the hospital right now with the healing power of God, because this world is in desperate need of healing, not prophesying. Okay, they'll say healing is done away with. They'll say miracles is done away with. But they'll say, you know what? We still can prophesy. That don't make no sense. We need healing. We need miracles more than we need words. Paul even said, I came to you not in word only, but in power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit. So we need action. We don't need words. So if you was to go inside of a hospital right now and you was to empty it out, all the sick folks, I guarantee you at least 90% of those people is going to join your church, okay? So if if God really wanted it to, to go that way, where, you know, Jesus forgave you of everything, and now you got this healing power, and you can bring the whole world to Christ, he could have made it go that way, but that, that's not happening because there is a huge problem, I believe, in Christianity. That's just what I believe. I, I look at Christianity like, the, the, the dream of Joseph, when Joseph dreamed of seven uh, fat flesh cows, and then he dreamed of seven skinny cows, and there was a year of plenty, seven years of plenty, and then there was seven years of a famine, and I believe that's all going into God's word. I believe that those seven skinny cows represents the New Testament that has destroyed the seven fat flesh cows, and that is the Old Testament. I believe that the New Testament totally destroyed everything the Bible stands for. It is the total opposite. The New Testament is going north. The, the Old Testament is going south. Everything that's in the New Testament contradicts what's going on in the Old Testament. And the number one issue is justifying the wicked. Paul teaches us that one man Die for the sins of the world. And in the entire Old Testament, God is saying everyone is going to die for their own sins. No one is going to pay for nobody's sins. But in the New Testament, here we have Paul teaching that one man died for the sins of the people. There's no reference of that in the Old Testament. There's no reference of that nowhere but Paul. Paul brought that teaching out. That one man died for everybody else. The most a Christian can do is go to Isaiah 53, where it says he will make his soul an offering for sin only one time. And then look at that scripture and say, oh, that's what that's talking about. But they can't go to Hosea. They can't go to Moses. They can't go nowhere else and find a good reference to Jesus dying for their sins. They can't do it. It's not in there. I mean, yeah, I, I suppose there's no human sacrifice for sins. Nowhere. Moses was against it. They was they were taking their children and passing them through the fires. They was passing them through the fires of Molech. They was doing child sacrifice, and Moses was instructed by God to warn them about that. That's what they were doing. If you go to Deuteronomy chapter 21, that's what they were doing. Moses told them not to cause their children to pass through the fire. Oh, but God takes his beloved son and, and, and slays him for everybody. This is the stuff that the atheists and people who are smart that uses a little logic. They're like, this stuff don't make no sense. This don't make no sense. Either you tear the Old Testament out or you and you just keep the New Testament 
or you tear the New Testament out and you keep the Old Testament. That's what the Israelis are doing. They don't want the New Testament. They don't want that. Okay. But then you got the Christians who, pers who, who wants the best of both worlds. They want the best of both worlds, but all they want to do is stay in John. <laughs> they want to, uh, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, oh, before Abraham was I, they, they just John, they like Joy John. All they have is John and Paul. They don't have nothing coming from Moses where he is saying Jesus is going to die for your sins. Moses condemns it. He's against child sacrifice. God of the Bible is against child sacrifice. He didn't even sacrifice Isaac. He didn't kill Isaac. It was a test. He did not kill Isaac. And I believe that God doesn't change. I believe that the God of the Bible is the same God today. He wants repentance. And that's what we teach in Islam. We teach repentance. We teach that's repentance. Teach. It's repentance. That's what God wants. He wants you to repent of your sins. There's no repentance in the New Testament. They say it is. But you turn to the Lord Jesus or whatever, whatever, but he died for your sins. So repentance in the Old Testament was you save yourself through your good works and God's mercy. Not nobody coming to die for your sins. Well, I mean, there's so many points. It, you know, it's, it's like uh, repentance is showing good faith that you are truly a Christian. Like, uh, if you're not repenting, you can lose your salvation. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's, I think when, if you're a real Christian, you know that. Because I know that a lot of Christians, they think they're saved, but they're not. Uh, you know, you can't just be like, you know, pedophile and call yourself a Christian. You have to repent. Uh, what you mean by pedophile? There's no age of marriage in the Bible. <laughs> Where's the age? What, how old do you have to be to get married? Well, the... That's a white, I, I'm not trying to be racist, but that's a white man's word. White man uses that word pedophile, but there are people today in, in Mexico and other parts of the world that are getting married at like 14, 15 years old. That, that, that word pedophile is not in the Bible. That is a man's word. There's no age of marriage in the entire Bible or the Quran. There's no holy book from God where he is saying a woman has to be this age to get married. Well, you, I mean, you know the Bible verse that says anyone who causes one of these little ones to stumble or hurts even a hair on their head. That's false teaching. That's not clear. That's not clear. Yeah. Let me tell you what's clear. Do not commit adultery. That's clear. That's clear. There's no excuse in that. There's no, there's no wiggle room. There's no manipulation. God is almighty and all wise. Everything that he made clear, like eating pork, there's no excuse for it. He said, don't eat it. It's clear. We don't have to look through a metaphor and make it mean something. It's clear. But there's no clear age of marriage in the entire Bible. And the Bible says that sin is the transgression transgression of the law and where there is no law there is no sin so unless you show me a chapter and verse where it says a woman has to be this age to get married all you have is is i ain't gonna say that all you have is man's wisdom that's all you have because the age of marriage differed with the time and it's all about what era you was in okay and there is no age of marriage in that thick Bible you have. None. You're making assumptions again. You're doing exactly what the prophet said. He said all the Christian have is assumption, conjecture, superstition. The, the, the Bible also says that the Holy Spirit will be given to lead us in truth. And it says that if all the things Jesus had performed and done were written in a book, there wouldn't be a book big enough on the whole earth to... Yeah, that's your boy, Joy John. That's John. You only got one reference on that, huh? All right. Well, I said I said the Holy Spirit will lead you in all truth, and that is also, I suppose, no. not. No, no. John is the only one that says that. All you have is John, man. I know my Bible. John talks about that in John 14, 15, John 16. 
There is not one scripture in the entirety of the Bible that tells you how old you have to be to get married. Don't you know there was a king that got married at eight years old? Yeah. Okay, he got married. They gave him wives at eight years old in your Bible. According to the Bible, he was a pedophile. Okay, according to the Bible, Lot was a pedophile. He slept with his two daughters. One was older, one was younger. The Bible calls him a righteous man in the book of Peter. Well, it, so this is what I'll say is uh, the, the story of Lot, even, first of all, he was, he was asleep or drunk. Uh, so he didn't really consent. But, uh, you know, the Bible, uh, it, it doesn't, uh, just because it doesn't uh, mention it, it doesn't mean that it's not, uh, you know. Uh, if there's no, the, your Bible says there's no law. There's no sin where there's no law. Does it not say that in the book of 1 John? Sin, what is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. When you break the law, that is called sin. But if you don't break the law, there is no sin. Right here in California, if I want to, I can smoke marijuana. That's not against the law. Okay, it might be against the law in other places, but where I'm at, there is no sin in me transgressing the law of this government. Okay, and I don't smoke weed, but I'm just telling you, where there is no law, there is no sin, and if God wanted to, he could have said, you know what, I want a woman this age to get married. But there are women who are having their periods at remarkably Young ages, young ages, you don't know. God didn't give us any clear guidance on how old a woman is supposed to be. According to history, Mary, the mother of Jesus, was probably about 13 years old when she had him. And, and I also would like to point out, not everything that is mentioned in the Bible is supported by God. I'm sure God did not support many of the things that were going on, like Lot sleeping with his daughters, or however you want to look at it, vice versa. So, just because it's mentioned doesn't mean God is, is proving it. It's just it's supposed to show it an example. And also, the uh, a lot of the you know New Testament uh, age of accountability. Uh, you know, it's it's there's like even even uh, it says that uh, when Jesus was twelve, he said, "I'm about my father's business," and but. It's, it's, you know, I mean. Yeah, but you got to still answer for the king that was 18 years old, man. The eight-year-old king. He was eight years old and he got married, man. There's no age on marriage. All you can do is go by the man, what man say. All you can do is go by the traditions of man, which is something was that Jesus was vehemently against. He was against the traditions of man all the time. All the time he was against the traditions of man. There's no age in marriage. But what man wants to do, man wants to be God. And I'm not being racist, but I'm just being honest. That is a white man's term. They use that word pedophile and don't even realize that there were pedophiles in the Bible. And there is no age of marriage in the Bible. Period. Yeah, that means, you know, the His, what was the boy's name? His name, I'm going to find his name, too. The man, the boy was young. I was like, I studied that a while ago. There was an eight-year-old boy that was king in the Bible. That, but, but I think that's mostly for to preserve the lineage. I don't know if that was necessarily he was going around. To Josiah. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And they got the man married. He was married. And don't say, see, you, you know, all you got is speculation. That's assumption. That's assuming. No, the Bible says the boy was eight years old. He got married. And you know what? He had children. Okay, so that 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 that, that right there ought to, you know, you know, tell you that you just need to watch your mouth. You you don't you don't want to speak against stuff that you don't know. I don't want to speak against stuff that I don't know. Like, for instance, I'm so glad when I came to Islam, I didn't have much negative stuff to say about it because I didn't know it. I didn't want to be talking against something that I didn't know. 
I had to study it for myself. And I'm so glad that I didn't go that route of bashing something that I ended up converting to. Because that's going to take a lot of pride. <laughs> that's going to take a lot of pride being swallowed. So I'm glad that I, I didn't go that route. And I know a lot of people who are beating their head up against the stone. They talking trash about Islam and then converting the next year because he is merciful. And that is in 2 Chronicles 34 and 1, where Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. All right. And the man got married in that chapter. They actually got him. Let me see. Let me get the verse for you. Let me see. Let me see this dude. He, you know, the Bible, the Bible also says, although we're not under the law, it says that how much worse it is to trample on the blood of the Messiah. That's an unknown author, man. You're going to the Book of Hebrews. You're going to the Book of Hebrews, man. You got to show me some references of what that guy is saying. I'm not going to go by a Hebrew of Hebrews. Paul was a Pharisee. He called himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. And during Jesus' time, the Pharisees had false teaching. They had false teaching. And none of the stuff he was bringing out has nothing to do with a child marrying a woman. You can't show me one scripture in the Quran. You can't show me one scripture in the Bible. Where a person is has to be a certain age to get married. That is all man's words. And it's so sad that I got to talk like this. But there's so many dummies that say pedophile, pedophile, pedophile. And don't even know there's no law on it. Why is God allowing this little girl to have a period? And to, and to produce uh, organs, I mean uh, um, eggs. To be able to have a child if the child is not ready. This is nonsense. This is the stuff that we have lost out. Okay. We lost out on all this common knowledge. We do not have the knowledge that Jesus and the people before Jesus had when it comes to women. We don't have their knowledge. We're speculating. We're keeping it. We're, 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 we're trying our best to make America great again. Okay. We're just doing what we think is right. The Bible says a man's ways is right in his own eyes, but the end thereof is death. And it makes a lot of sense marrying a woman at a young age because she's teachable and she's moldable. Okay. There's a whole lot of benefit in it. Okay. And I'm not Telling people to go marry somebody that's a minor, I'm not preaching that, but what I'm saying is all you can do is go by your own words when you want to say the word pedophile. It's not a Bible word. Well, I'm, I'm looking at, I mean, you know, pornea, you know, sexually explicit activity. Um, I mean, that's you know, nothing to do with minors. Saying, yeah. That's going into lasciviousness. That's going into inordered affection. You know, Paul talks about that. But there's no scripture where he's saying, hey, uh, I don't want you to marry a girl that is this age. Okay, that, that's what that's going into. Even when it says flee youthful lust, that's going into when a person is young, they young, dumb and full of cum and they just want to mess around with everything. And when you're young, you have that 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 desire. You have that that passion to 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 go after the flesh. That's not even dealing with minors, according to the Bible, according to the Quran. There is no clear direction on the age of marriage. Now, I hope we can at least agree on that, man, because that's gonna make it look really bad. If I'm presenting truth, I'm presenting truth. I'm presenting truth. And then you you're gonna disagree with everything. <laughs> I I can't I can't outright disagree with what you're saying. I can give circum circumstantial evidence. You know God's you know written His law in our hearts. Uh, you know like but then you'd accuse me of 
you know, using doctrines of men. And, and I, did, I did make a number of claims. I said, not everything, you know, the Bible is the wisdom unto salvation. It doesn't include every detail. Um, yeah, that's why we believe that the... Pro yeah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It doesn't include a lot of details about uh, slavery, abortion, um, pedophilia, different things like that. But, uh, you know, we, we, we assume those things are wrong. Uh, you know, there's some circumstantial evidence. Like I said, Jesus, uh, when he was first found in his father's house, he was 12 years old, in the book of Luke. And, um, you know, the, I mean, there's just, and I did I did mention, you know, make one of these little ones stumble. And, you know, you're not... That don't to have nothing to do. That's false teaching, man. You got to stay in the context. Is the context talking about marriage? So it's ambiguous. It's not entirely... It's you know, not, man. You you got to come down from you got to get off the 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 you know I do I know you do a lot of typologies and all that but you got to get down to context. The context is not talking about anything to do with marriage. Okay, a marriageable age is going into a virgin, a woman that is having a period. It's not necessarily going into uh, you happen to be a certain age because with every woman is different. Every woman is ready at different times. Okay, so there is no clear direction. Okay, there isn't. And, you know, we just got to at least agree upon that. You can go to a scripture and say you think it means this, but can you go to a scripture where it says uh, you have to be a certain age? No, I can't. I can't. Okay, then that, I wouldn't even speak on that. I literally would keep my mouth closed on stuff that I don't have any knowledge on. Because then you sound like a fool, especially when somebody brings out an eight-year-old king? An eight-year-old king? Come on, man. This isn't the Bible. This is written for our learning. This is written for our uh, edification. You know, this is the knowledge we have of the times. A lightning bolt didn't come out of heaven and say, Oh, dear God, this guy just had sex at eight years old. And, you know, I'll tell you the truth about the matter. The thing that God hates the most, according to the Bible, is homosexuality. He hates that. That's what Sodom and Gomorrah was guilty of. He was, they was guilty of homosexuality. Now, you want to talk about the wrath of God get into homosexuality in which the Christian church, okay, they are justifying, okay, homosexuality. There are gay Christian churches with a King James Bible on their pulpit. And they're teaching that David was gay. They're teaching that Jonathan was gay. They're doing what Christians love to do. They're looking at a Bible verse and telling you what it means. They're interpreting. That's what the Christians do. They interpret. They interpret. They interpret. And right now we are at the point that Christianity has the most gay churches out of all religions. We even have a president who is justifying homosexuality. Okay? I know, I, That's I, the I, truth, I, man. It's not just an offense against man, like you're saying. It's a, it's a changing of your identity. It's an offense against God. It's the same sort of, my belief, a uh, change in identity that we are going to uh, be uh, pursuing when we... Uh, Receive the mark of the beast, not me. I'm, you know, not going to be here, okay. you know, for that. Uh, and it's, 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 it, it, my, I think what the mark of the beast is going to do, not just allow you to buy and sell, you know, but obviously claim, you know, your, your allegiance to, uh, you know, the government or whatever they're going to do, but mm -hmm. it's going to change your DNA. It's going to be like some sort of a, it's going to turn you into a, some sort of, you know, hybrid. And, and, you know, this was, this was what was happening with the Nephilim back in Genesis, and it said it will be when the Son of Man returns like it was uh, in the days of Lot, meaning mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, people were pursuing homosexuality, changing their identity, like people, like you're saying, calling David, other, you know, mm -hmm. the Old Testament person, people, uh, you know, uh, homosexuals, Jesus is asexual, they're coming up with all these fake, you know, different, uh, you know, terms for classifying people, and God is going to personally get involved, just like he did in Genesis. And what was happening, the reason why I believe Noah was found righteous was not because, you know, obviously he was a drunk and, you know, there was that problem with incest, other stuff was going on too. He wasn't the perfect person, but he kept his blood pure. And just like when Jesus came to the earth to shed his blood for humanity, 
they called him the son of man because he needed to shed human blood to atone for humanity's sins. Now, if you're some sort of a hybrid, the blood of Jesus cannot apply to you. Just like if you take the mark of the beast, it's not forgivable because you're changing your DNA. So it's not, the, the, the salvation of Jesus' blood won't apply to you in the same time. It's not because God doesn't want to forgive you, it's because you've changed your identity. And you no longer qualify for the for giving atoning blood of Christ. So, you know, G Jesus said Noah was found righteous. I believe that it was because he did not, um, you know, have um, tainted blood. His pure blood was pure and true. And everyone else was, uh, you know, wiped out in the flood. They were giving themselves away to this, uh, you know, promiscuity sexually. Um, and I don't think God is really concerned with, uh, you know, sin. Obviously, he knows sin is destructive. But when it comes to, uh, you know, losing all hope of saving people, God had to step in at the last moment and just wipe everybody out. So that's my take on that, you know, issue of, you know, identity, homosexuality personally. Uh, and there's lots of examples of God not letting people just do whatever they want mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to saying who they are, who they think they are. God said, I made you this way, male and female. And even Jesus says it. He said, in the beginning, God made them male and female. Now, people will say, well, Jesus never said it's, it's uh, you're not allowed to be homosexual. Well, mm -hmm. he said, you shall, you were made male and female. That is implied that they should, uh, you know, not be changing whatever they think they're changing, which you can't. You can never, just just on the basis of talking about gender, you can't change from a male to a female. There's too many differentiating characteristics between two genders. You can't ever become the opposite gender. Um, it's not possible. It's too many too many differences. Uh, could go through a dozen. So that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's just point. It's people trying to be God, like you're saying. And I, and I don't want to be God. I don't want to try to play, you know, like, I know everything. You know, some things I just go on the authority of the Holy Spirit, really. That's what the Bible says. It says that the Holy Spirit will lead you in all truth. So not everything that is necessary is included in the Bible, but the Holy Spirit sort of fills in the details and the gaps for a lot of those missing pieces. That's the only argument I can really make. Because, okay. like you're saying, I can't give you a black and white in the Bible, you know, this is wrong. Yeah. But the but the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit convicted me or did not convict me, uh, and, and and I know when God convicts you, you know, he'll show you, he'll show you, hey, you know, I could just toss you out. And, you know, God, God's not wanting to do that. But okay. If so, obey God, if you're a real Christian, you know, you have, you have a, you have a spirit inside of you that basically telling you, do this or don't do this for certain things. Okay. Yeah. So that's the only argument I can make. Yeah. Well, the Holy Spirit is a mystery, I believe, in the Christian church. And I truly believe that the Holy Spirit is going into the comforter and that's going into the final messenger. Because we have knowledge uh, on the way we use the restroom. We have knowledge on the way we eat. We have knowledge in different areas that the Christians have no knowledge. We have a lot of insight and so when you type in comforters in your bible the first time it's going to show up is going to be in the story of david dealing with the king of ammon and comforters were people that came on the scene with bad news you know when bad news uh took place they would come and comfort the people comforters have never ever been a ghost all of a sudden now in the new testament the, the comforter, some ghost, some Holy Spirit. I mean, and I disagree with that. I truly disagree with that. I believe that the Holy Spirit can mean one or the two things. It can go into the revelation that was given by the angel Gabriel unto the last and final messenger. And when he spoke, he didn't speak from his own feelings. When he spoke, he spoke. It was a revelation from God. He destroyed the idols. He told us that Jesus is nothing more than a messenger. Mary is nothing to be worshipped. That he is nothing to be worshipped. The only one that we ought to worship is God Almighty. All he did was restore the monotheism that the Bible um, used to have. That's all he did. And he teaches repentance. And a lot of people disagree. And I agree to disagree because I've been a Christian for 20 years. Trust me. I know all the messages. I know all the loops for the most part. 
Um, I've learned all their doctrines. I've learned from all a lot of their best teachers today. I was all around um, from the, the practical teachers to those that were um, apostolic um, all around. OK, I have about 20 years in that lifestyle and I've realized that it's nothing more than fake gold. It's nothing but idolatry. If it wasn't for Islam. OK, right now I would be in a Israelite camp that don't believe that the white man has salvation. I would believe that the white man is the devil. I would have nothing to do with anything um, that um, the white man does. So Islam saved me and let me see that all races are important. Not the Bible, because according to the Bible, God chooses a chosen people above another people. God has always treasured the children of Israel. And even Jesus said he didn't come to gather the Greeks. He said he came to gather the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So if it wasn't for Islam today, I would be a racist. And Islam saved me. Islam has given me, uh, given my life to uh, order and structure um, Christianity was easy. There was no discipline. But right now, I ain't gonna lie. Islam is a challenge. Islam is a challenge for me. And it's it's like playing a game on advanced. Christianity was like playing game on like beginner's mode. But, uh, uh, but Islam is way more advanced. Like it really requires discipline. And so I'm happy to be where I'm at. And I got about 10 more minutes. Um, and is there anything um, that you want to bring out? I want to try to see if we can get one more question before my time to pray. And see if we can get one more question that's deep in our notes that was bothering us. Um, and I'm looking at mine. And I pretty much... Um, asked you all the questions besides um, broken bones to disqualify a Passover lamb. Where is that in the Bible? Yeah, he, uh, let me pull that up. Yeah, the Passover lamb, uh, they cannot break the bones. Let's see if I can. Oh, there. That's not it. So, without blemish, uh, one man. Broken bones. Well, that's, I guess, in John 19, 30 through 36 is what I'm looking at. All right, John 19. Yeah, but I don't, but that would not be the Old Testament. No, see, I'm looking for a reference where God is telling us, because I know according to the Bible, a sacrifice was an animal. Um, and the sacrifice could be a woman sometimes. It could be a female for a sin offering. It could be a male. Um, there was many different um, stipulations. Uh, a firstborn without blemish couldn't be uh, couldn't be some beat up uh, sheep. It couldn't be. It had to have no blemishes. Okay, you couldn't just bring anything to God to sacrifice, and I know that from studying the Bible. Um, he got on them in Malachi for bringing them lame sacrifices and blind, uh, blind animals. And he was, you know, telling them, you know, would I accept this? Would I accept, you know, uh, an animal that is blind? No, he's not going to accept just any sacrifice. And so I was trying to find a reference in the Old Testament where it tells us about a Passover lamb. And the only person in the Bible who talked about a Passover lamb is Paul. He tells us that. And the other and the other person who said something about a lamb uh, is John the Baptist. And I teach that John the Baptist is a type and shadow of the Apostle Paul. They have a lot of parallels. Um, John the Baptist didn't follow Jesus. John the Baptist had his own thing. Um, Jesus had his own thing. John the Baptist was considered the greatest prophet, born of a woman. 
Uh, John the Baptist was in prison. John the Baptist was in the wilderness. John the Baptist had on camel's hair. John the Baptist got on the relationship ministry. He was talking about Herod's wife. And John the Baptist was beheaded. And all those same qualities and similarity traits is in Paul. Paul was in prison. Paul um, was from the tribe of Benjamin. I refer to him as the wolf in sheep clothing. Paul called himself the father of the Christian church. Paul um, not only um, was in prison, but he also was beheaded according to church history. He was beheaded just like Paul. Okay, yeah. so. So this is, yeah, I mean, I hear what you're saying. So, I mean, I hear everything you're saying. This, uh, this is the, uh, what is it? Speak ye the congregation of Israel, saying, Tenth day of this month, take to them every man a lamb. This is Exodus chapter 12. According to the faith of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And then, uh. The lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year, take it from out of the sheep or the goats. Um, and then take the blood and strike it on the two side posts and the upper door post of the house. And so that actually is pretty interesting. So you, I mean, you just read more about like the Passover lamb requirements in Exodus 12 there, but it actually is um, a reference to birth, to deliverance. You know, when you give birth to a baby, you deliver the baby. It's actually, when they put the blood on the sides of the door and above the door, it's actually supposed to be symbolic of a vagina uh, during birth, you know, when there's bloody birth. Uh, and it's people, it's symbolic to show the people of Israel, they were just on the verge of being delivered from their circumstance, their situation. And so God, when he, uh, you know, used that, um, you know, blood on the doorpost, it was uh, symbolic of deliverance, of uh, giving birth. And, uh, you know, nation of Israel uh, being led out of Egypt to promised land. And, and that blood on the doorpost the was only for the Israelites. It wasn't for everybody else. Yeah, yeah I mean... It yeah, wasn't. But at the... This, so, in this is another uh, verse. So, Luke chapter 4, verse 30. Um, God gets pretty upset with Israel because for hundreds, thousands of years, Israel's you know, being disobedient and just like God wanted to raise up a beautiful people that want to change the world, be a light on a hill. And then he tells, Jesus tells the light on the hill sermon to the Gentiles, mostly the Jews that listen, but, you know, uh, you know, the Jewish people, but anyone there. And, but it says in Luke chapter four, verse 30, really going to go maybe a little bit uh, earlier than that. It says, um, yeah, they, they, they got it. I t truly, I tell you, in that uh, verse, starting at verse 24, chapter, Luke chapter 4, verse 24. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there are many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land, yet Elijah did not send to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath, uh, in the region of Sidon, in, in Sidon. Um, and there were many is in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only in the Ammon and the Syrian. Um, so all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. Jesus, but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. So in this, Jesus is showing that he's done with the Israel Israelites. Like It's like miraculous. Like He just kind of is about to get killed, and he just walks right through the crowd. And it's God saying, like, I'm literally just done with you. Like, you guys have just throughout the centuries completely disregarded what I've told you to do in the wilderness, in the years of the kings, in, at every step. You just refuse to let me into your heart and let me, my spirit, guide you. So now I'm moving on. I'm moving through you. I'm going to the Gentiles. God is actually rejecting Israel in that you know, chapter, um, you know. Uh, in, implicitly, indirectly. So, you know, God, he did choose the Israelite people, but they he wants people's hearts. He was hoping to raise up a, you know, righteous group, but they didn't really listen. So he was more concerned with righteousness than he was with uh, the race. He chose them, but still, the 
the, the point is he's looking at the heart. So that's my that's my interpretation. Okay. Well, man, um, it, it's been a pleasure. I got about a couple minutes, man. It's been a pleasure. Um, Absolutely. Um, I okay. wish the best for you on your situation, man, and condolences. And um, like I said, we can stay at it. Um, and like I said, I'm going to do the same thing as last time, send you everything, all right? Yeah, absolutely. Send me more. I'm going to um, just prepare a little bit better for the next uh, time. Oh, it's your topic I'm, next time. You I've pick the topic. Sick. I've been doing so much. So, um, oh, man, I got to have something good. All right. <laughs> yeah, it'll be something. I'll send something. Yep, just back. send me Thank emails you. and let me know. Give me about a week to study, all right? Yes. Yeah, Sundays work best for me. Yeah, you got it. All right, thank you so much. All right, man. Bless you, man. You have a great night. You too. And thank you again, man. Thank you again. God bless. Right there, we just had a awesome discussion. This brother still was mellow, and you let us know in the comments what was interesting to you. All right, God bless that brother. Um, may the Lord lead and guide us all into His will. Peace and blessings. Assalamualaikum.